So we've reached the final session, session number four. And what we'll be doing in this session is looking at the inner meanings of prayer. So one of the things that Imam Ghazali does in this book is that he first starts, he walks us through the prayer in relation to the outward meanings. And so he talks about these same uh, stations of the prayer that we're going to be talking about now in relation to fiqh, the outward dimension. What are the legal rulings of them? And then what he does is he goes back through and then he starts to speak about their spiritual meaning. And this is extremely, extremely helpful. And this is something that is not enough to just go through this once. It's not too hard to understand. As we will see, the meanings are fairly clear. But this is something that we want to take good notes and remind ourselves of regularly. And to go back to these meanings because these are the meanings in addition to what we've already heard that are going to bring the prayer to life. This is what's going to make your prayer of a much greater qualitative value. And so he begins with the Adhan. And so one of the meanings of the Adhan that we can bring to heart is, he says, is to bring to mind the dreadful summons on the Day of Resurrection. So on the Day of Resurrection, we're all standing before Allah. Every single human being will wait for his or her name to be called. And so when we hear the Adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, internally, we should re remind ourselves that we're going to hear our name called on the Day of Judgment. We're all going to be summoned. We're all going to be resurrected and then driven to the plane of judgment. So immediately, and Imam Sha'rani notes, and it's really helpful, that the Adhan, the Iqama, and the Takbir, the Haram prayer, all begin with Allah Akbar. The Adhan begins with Allahu Akbar. The call to commence begins with Allahu Akbar. And the prayer begins with Allahu Akbar. So the meaning of Allahu Akbar is central to our preparation for prayer and then entering into it. It's central to how it is that we are in prayer. And that's coming when we get to what is called the takbir or ihram. So the Adhan, we bring to mind the summoning of Yawm al of the Day of Resurrection. And his advice to us then is to what? Devote yourself inwardly and outwardly to responding to this call and hastening to fulfill what it is calling to. So the Adhan is a pivotal moment there. And unfortunately, we don't get to hear the Adhan as much as you would if you were in the Muslim country. It's one of the beauties of being in the Muslim world is hearing the Adhan. We're deprived of that oftentimes, unfortunately. And uh, there was a question earlier about uh, the other Adhans, um, and that as Ustad Amjad mentioned, it's good that we call the Adhan. We should be calling the Adhan. So in your home, when you are playing that one congregational prayer, have someone call the Adhan. And again, that in the absence of it, it's perfectly fine to use prayer apps in a fudger clock or something to remind you that the prayer is entered. But in addition to that, also call the Adhan. Because this is now that in our minds when we hear this, now we transition. Something's wanted from us now that we have to prepare for. So again, getting ourselves ready for prayer and devoting ourselves to the preparation that of it. And that we know that and specifically, and specifically in relation to the Adhan, that our Prophet used to say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Uh, Give us rest by it, O Bilal. And so that our Prophet said, because his quarter to Ain is that his true pleasure and his true joy was in prayer, he was longing for the Adhan. And that's what brought him raha and repose, is that now it's time to stand before Allah. And again, we're only doing it obligatorily five times a day. It could have been much more. But those are moments that, subhanAllah, if we focus on the prayer, everything else in the spiritual path opens up after that. This is it. This is where we begin. If we want to talk about spiritual, the spiritual path, it begins here with the prayer. So then the next meaning 
is purification. So we're going to get ready for prayer then. And we purify, just as we purify our limbs outwardly by putting water on them, we purify our heart by repenting from sin. So as we are putting that water on our face, it is a means to cleanse us outwardly, but also we're thinking about everything that we've done that with our eyes, seeking forgiveness from Allah, as we are putting water on our arms, as we're rinsing our mouth, and so forth and so on. Is that this is a means of cleansing and purification of our limbs, but also our heart. And so this is a time when we purify ourselves, is that we also purify our heart by repenting from sin, having remorse what we've done in the past, and resolving never to fall short again. So the Adhan, this is reminiscent of being summoned by, to Allah, and purification and all of its meanings of everything that we've done on our limbs and our heart. And then, of course, we have to have clean clothing. And just as we have certain substances that might get on our clothes or on our bodies or on the place of prayer that prevent the validity of the prayer, likewise, there are that certain that other substances that are that substances not necessarily outwardly, inwardly, that stain our hearts and prevent them from that receiving the meanings that they are supposed to receive. So purification in both of its meanings, actual wudu itself, and then cleansing our clothes and things like that, removing any type of filth or najas or anything like that. And then is that covering ourselves. There's a particular way that we dress for prayer. And there's, of course, the obligations that the scholars have said, what is called the aura, our legal nakedness. And we have to know that in relation to the outward dimension of prayer. There are certain things that, can, that have to be covered. But then, likewise, just as we cover parts of our body that are unbefitting for other people to see, but what about the state of our heart? What is unbefitting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see that's in our heart? There is no veil that can conceal that from Allah. So we have to think about that meaning. There's certain things that are not appropriate for other people to see, so we cover them. What a blessing from Allah. And likewise is that we have to cover up these meanings that are in our heart with forgiveness by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And then what we're going to do after this is that we face the qibla. Okay, so we've heard the adhan that we have purified ourselves and then we're going to face the qibla. So you're going to actually go towards the place of prayer. And outwardly you're orienting yourself in a particular direction. So facing the qibla means you outwardly turn your face away from every other direction toward the house of Allah. Precisely by facing one particular direction, you are not facing any other direction. So you're facing that single direction. You're turning away, in a sense, from all those other directions towards the direction you are facing. And the meaning here is, turn your heart away from every other matter and toward Allah. So outwardly, you're turning away from every other direction except where you're facing. And inwardly, you're turning your heart towards Allah. Like, imagine if you bring that to mind over and over again, over and over again how your whole experience of prayer will entirely change. And that statement, that the story, or the, uh, the statement of Hatim al Asam that Ustad MJ mentioned, let's review that. I want to make sure everybody got that down. So what did he say when he, that when he was asked uh, about how he prayed? Okay, what was the first thing that he did? Okay, so before that, he would sit down in his place of prayer and gather himself. Okay? So then he stands up for prayer. And what, is, what does he bring to mind? The Kaaba, heard it, is right before him. Okay? And the Sirat, the traverse, which is the bridge over the hellfire, is right beneath him. And then what else? Jannah is on his right, and the Nara is on his left. 
So the Kaaba is before him. He imagines Jannah to the right, Nar to the left, and he's standing on the Sirat. And then the angel of death is right behind him. He doesn't know whether this is going to be his last prayer or not. And there's more to that, but if we can remember that. This is the time where we would bring this to heart. When we first start to face the Qibla. And you imagine that you're right before the Kaaba. And all of those other powerful mashahid that will force the heart to be present. That will force the heart to be present when we think about those things. So facing the Qibla, you're turning your heart away from every other matter. And then the Iqama, which is the call to commence, is that we bring to heart the imminence of the meeting with Allah. Because the Adhan is recommended to be prolonged. So that, you know, when it's resigned, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Whereas the Iqama is recited quickly. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And depending upon how they're both recited differently, have a different effect upon you. This is the that iqama, the call to commence. Khalas, prayer is about to begin. And it's the meeting with Allah is imminent. And so that affects you in a different way. So you hear the call to commence and you bring to mind the imminence that's about to happen of the meeting with Allah. And then we have the standing position. So we're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we are standing before Allah, is that we realize in our souls, in our hearts, the greatness of speaking intimately with Allah. That we are standing right before Allah. And what a blessing. This is how prayer begins in the standing position. And we will all be standing before Allah on the Day of Judgment. Standing. This is that a special that act of the acts of prayer and when we are worshiping. And so that we are standing before Allah and we bring to heart that we are before Him. And when we slightly lower our heads, which is the sunnah, is that this is an indication of humility. You'd slightly lower your head out of humility that you're standing before your Lord. And again, we remind ourselves just as we are standing before Allah, now for prayer, that we are going to be standing before him on the Day of Judgment. And then we make the intention. And we have to memorize the intention that we make outwardly, according to the sacred law. But in doing so, we want to remind ourselves, especially at this time, of sincerity. This is for Allah. And in some schools, says that this is exactly what you do. So for instance, we just prayed Salat al-Dhuhr, Nawaitu, Fadl al-Dhuhr, Arba Raka'as. Right? You mentioned what is that the obligatory things to mention, Ma'muman, that Lillahi Ta'ala. This is for Allah. So you remind yourself at the intention, at the level of the intention, this is for Allah. In addition to the outward intention that you're making, specifying the prayer, whether it's far or not, and so forth. Okay, so we have the Adhan, we have the state of purification, cleansing the body from its impurities, covering the body, facing the Qibla, calling the Iqama, standing before Allah, making the intention, and then now we're ready to say the Takbir al ihram And one thing the scholars mention is good, is to recite Surat al, surat al Nas. That's recommended. So, nas. It's one of the ways to help you from waswasa. The whisperings of shaitan is that just before you enter into your prayer, you recite Surat al Nas. Okay, so then we're going to say the Takbir al Ihram. So, the Takbira is a single instance of saying Allahu Akbar. And the idea of ihram here is, just as we say ihram al hajj is the state of pilgrim sanctity. Once you make the intention to enter into a state of pilgrim sanctity, certain things that are permissible are now haram. 
certain things now, once you enter into the prayer, Allahu Akbar, the moment before you said that, they were permissible. You can talk, you can eat, you can move, however you want to move. But once you say Allahu Akbar, khalas. You can't talk, you can't eat, you can't do other things, laugh. This is the time to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you shouldn't be texting on your phone or anything else. I always remember the story that one of our teachers said that he actually saw someone answer his that cell phone in prayer. So he pulls out his cell phone and he says, Oh, suddenly, I'm praying. And he put his cell phone away. You don't want to do that. That would actually break your prayer. So when you say, Takbir al haram Allah Akbar, is that they say that by lifting your hands, you're making intention to throw the dunya behind your back. Khalas. The world, you throw it behind your back completely. You're ridding yourself of it. Allahu Akbar. And when you say this, that we need to make sure, we should strive at least, that nothing is greater to us than Allah. Nothing is greater to us than Allah. So that when our tongue says Allahu Akbar, our heart does not belie it. If there's anything in our hearts in that moment that is greater to us than Allah, then we're not truthful in our saying of Allahu Akbar, even though that's, what's, that's truth. And so if your desires have more power over you than the commandment of Allah, and so forth and so on, and you are more obedient to them than you are to Allah, then you have taken them as a god with a lowercase g and pronounced the takbir for them. And so that when we say Allahu Akbar, this is an opportunity for us to have complete concentration as we enter into our prayer. And one of the blessings is, at every stage of the prayer, with a few exceptions, we're saying Allahu Akbar. So we really want to reflect upon the points of Allahu Akbar and to make sure we bring that meaning to heart when we say it, because it's a way to get us back. So if, we, if our mind starts thinking about other things in the standing position, is that when we go into the bowing position, we're going to say Allahu Akbar. And when we come out, we say Sima Allah Alaihi Wasallam. But then when we go into sujood, we say Allahu Akbar. And so it's a way to always bring yourself back. So use the Allahu Akbar as a way to be present with Allah throughout your prayer. Bring yourself back. Your mind strays, bring yourself back. From the beginning of the prayer until the end. And then, uh, in some schools, there is what's called the opening supplication. This is in the Shafi school and the Hanafi school. Have their, both have their versions of what is known as the Dua Istiftah. In the Maliki school, of course, they're in a far prayer, they're saying Allahu Akbar and immediately saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And these are valid differences of the great Imams. But in the Shafi school, you are that saying Allahu Akbar Kabira, Walhamdulillah Kathir, wa Subhanallah, Bukratan Wasila. And then you're saying, What jahdu wa shalilladi fatara samuati wrat. I turn my face to him who created the heavens and the earth. In other words, you are now directing your heart to Allah. And this is one of the most special moments of all in life, are those moments where we are present with Allah of, and we're in a state of iqbal. And the meaning of being in a state of iqbal is that you are directing your heart to Allah, aware fully that He sees you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with the requisite lowliness and humility and brokenness that we should have before him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prayer is deep. It's deep. And we have to work on our prayer and practice our prayers, like anything else. You, Stephen Curry did not become the best three-point shooter ever just by, yeah, he, because he's the son of Dale Curry. Right? He has incredible work ethic, day in and day out, day in and day out, always trying to perfect his craft and his skills. And if people do this for dunya, how much more are we, should we be doing this for the hereafter? This takes work to perfect this. Prayer takes work to perfect it. It's not enough to just, you know, okay, I'm gonna, no, this takes work. And we have to make it a priority. But there's nothing more important for us to perfect than our prayers. This is what we want to perfect. And we want to get this right. 
So the opening supplication, if we're reciting that according to our school, the intention there is we're directing our essence to Allah. And then we're saying, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajeem This is what is known as the ta'awwadh. We are seeking refuge in Allah from shaitan. And one of the wisdoms of the ta'awwadh is, we, are real, we realize that we are unable to protect our own selves except through the power of Allah. We cannot be protected unless Allah protects us. Shaitan is our avowed enemy whom we do not see. And the only way to protect ourselves from shaitan is to uh, turn to Allah Taala and seek his help and to take refuge in him. And then Allah Taala will assist us. So it's a very powerful meaning. A'udhu billahi min shaitan when we say it like that, we're seeking, but again, all of these meanings always are taking us back to Allah. They always take us back to Allah. A'udhu billah, seeking refuge in Allah from shaitan. And then we're going to recite the Fatiha. And again, we want to outwardly learn how to recite the Fatiha correctly. And sit with someone who's trained in Tajweed to get your recitation correct, at least according to the bare minimum. And then we want to really reflect upon learn the basic meanings that we can reflect upon as we're reciting the Fatiha. And of course, the Fatiha is an ocean. But there are basic meanings that we can bring to mind as we're reciting. So when we say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we bring to heart that we know that absolutely everything is from Allah. In addition to that, we begin in His name, seeking His help in all of our affairs. Some say that bad for isti'ana, seeking the help of Allah. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Everything is from Allah seeking His help in everything this that we do. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That we have deep seated gratitude in our hearts for all of Allah's blessings. All of His blessings. And we praise Him. And then, Ar Rahman and Rahim. And again, we've already said Ar Rahman and Rahim and Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And now we're even repeating a second time, emphasizing. The centrality and the importance of mercy is that we bring to heart the comprehensive mercy of Allah in all of the meanings that the scholars say of Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. Maliki Yomiddin. And now this is where it gets Jalali. So it goes from Jamal to Jalal. That Maliki Yomiddin, that he is the king or the possessor of the day of judgment, Yomiddin. And so we bring to heart fear of the standing before Allah, before the King on the Day of Reckoning. And then we say, You alone do we worship. So we renew our sincerity. And so imagine if we're actually present with Allah, with that meaning in our prayer, at least 17 times a day in the thought prayers. How that will help us to have sincerity in everything it is that we do and actually renew our sincerity before every act. And that we also, that second part of that verse, and we're aware of our absolute need of Allah. Now we seek His help. <laughs> Guide us to the straight path. So we're in need of guidance. And then we're asking for guidance, but then <laughs> we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are people that he has guided, that he's bestowed his favor upon. Those are the people that we want to be like. And here, what are we intending? So we say, اِهْدِنَا صَرَاتُ مُسْتَقِيمُ سَرَاتَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Those who you bestowed your favor upon. And we know uh, in another verse, Allah Ta'ala says that وَمَنْ يُتِئِ اللَّهِ الرَّسُولِ so again, there's a mission of in'am. An'am Allah alim. Allah has bestowed His grace upon them. Min al-nabiyin, wa siddiqin, wa shuhada, wa sadiqin. Four categories. So what is our intention? None of us can be prophets. But when we say, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, sirat al-ladina namta alim, where is our aspiration? Do we just want to be good? Or is our aspiration to be from the sadiqin? Is our aspiration to be from the shuhada? Or is our aspiration to be from the Siddiqeen? We should make the intention to that Allah Ta'ala make us from the elect of the elect of His creation. 
and that we want to not just be from the lower ranks of those that he's bestowed his favor upon, but those who have high ranks. So we should make that intention every time we recite the Fatiha. Sirat al alayhim, ghayl al-mawdub alayhim wa al the two main archetypes of misguidance. The mawdub alayhim are those who have incurred Allah's wrath. They know, but they fail to put into practice. And the dalin are those who go astray without knowledge. Those are the main two archetypes of the different ways that people go astray. And then we're going to proceed after that to recitation of the Qur'an. And the Imam Ghazali in another place that he speaks about three degrees of recitation, the lowest of which is to bring to mind that we are standing before Allah. We're reciting before Allah. The second is, is that we bring to mind that Allah Ta'ala is addressing us individually. And of course, the first one that was addressed was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi by extension, that others. But we bring to mind that Allah is addressing us directly with His words. And then the third is one where someone moves up in the degrees of spiritual realization, where is that they witness the one speaking in the speech. And that's a lofty spiritual state. We speak about it because we want to know that it exists and we love the people who have attained that great degree. And we're inspired by their stories. So we strive to ascend in the degrees of recitation. And then we, after this, is that when we recite, and this is really helpful, and actually can be turned into a whole other seminar in and of itself. And in fact, the next retreat that we're having at Al-Maqasid is on book eight of the Ahiyyul Madin, of the book of the etiquettes of recitation of Quran. So Imam Musadi will go into a little bit more detail what he mentions here fairly briefly. He just gives here some small things that we can use as tools to help us reflect. And so he says that every time that you see a command in the Quran, the etiquette is that you have resolve to put it into practice. Every time that you see a prohibition in the Quran, you have resolve to avoid it. Every time you see a promise in the Quran, is that you have hope that you are from those that are recipients of that promise. Every time that there's a warning or threat in the Quran, there's fear. Every time that there's an admonition, is that you take heed. The stories of the prophets, you learn the lessons that are behind those. That every time there's a mention of his blessings upon us, is that you show gratitude. And so it's meant that as we recite the Quran, that all of this is coming out of our heart. This is how we're responding to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then after that, we're going to go into the bowing position. And look at how subhanAllah, that Ustaz Amjad mentioned the hadith, how the closest that a servant is to his Lord is when he's in a state of prostration. And how you're in the state of standing. And then you go into the bowing state. And this is a, a state where now, we are humbling ourselves before Allah. And this is a great opportunity for us to show our reverence and to be in awe of Him, the powerful King, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to glorify Him. And this is what we say, subhanahu wa rabbil azim. And bring into heart that we are bowing humbly before Him while glorifying Him. Then we're standing up and we're straightening up and that we're saying, Simi Allahu liman hamidah. Saying that Allah Ta'ala that responds to those who praise Him. Those who praise Him, Allah responds to them. He answers their call. That He, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, shows His mercy to His lowly servants. Rabbana wa lakal hamd. What a reminder. Simi Allahu, Allah hears us. And He answers our prayers, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So we're going back up. And now we're preparing ourselves for the position where we're closest to our Lord. Now we say, Allahu Akbar, and we go into sujood. And if we have humility in the bowing position, this is when we are in the utmost state of humility. Completely broken and feel that we're in absolute need of Allah. We should love sujood. Sujood should be beloved to us. SubhanAllah. And from the blessing of Allah, 
He gives us an opportunity to go into sujood, and we've been prepared for that from everything that proceeds. And this is where we show our utmost humility to Him. And then we come out of sujood, and we sit in that reverent way that we're taught to sit. And there's du'as that we can say, Rabbul Fili, Rabbul Fili, repeat that, or that other du'as that have been narrated by the Prophet But then now to emphasize the importance of sujood, we go back a second time. Sujood could have only been once. But Allah made us prostrate twice in our prayer. So utter humility, we come out, and then again, we prostrate again. Repeating what it is that we said in the previous sujood. And then if it is the, depending upon what cycle of prayer it is, we're going to go into the tashahud. The tashahud is the testification of faith. And it's here in the tashahud that we're reminded of how we got the prayer in the first place. The greatness of prayer, one of the, again, ways that we can come to this is how was the prayer revealed? Where did we get the prayer? We've all heard this probably many times before. On the Layl Isra al Mi'raj, when our Prophet was in the Divine Presence, where no one else went before him or after him, and even Gabriel السلام, couldn't go with him in the Divine Presence. And so the Prophet comes back from the Divine Presence with the gift of prayer. And the prayer is the ascension of the believer. That meaning is correct. It's the way that we ascend. And so when we say that the shahad, at tahiyat, al mubarakat, as salawat al tayyibat lillah, as salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabiyu, wa rahmatullahi wa barakat, as salamu alayna, wa ala ibadillahi salihin is that now this shows the connection to the Mi'raj of the Prophet Now how this is an individual opportunity for you and I to be present with Allah Ta'ala and to ascend through the prayer. And so we should learn all of those details of the meanings of the tashahud. And then of course that we, a part of that tashahud is ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah. We testify to the oneness of Allah and we bear witness that our Prophet وسلم, is the Messenger of Allah and we're sitting in that unique position with our right foot up with the utmost adab and manners proclaiming that all the prayers, all the good and all the wholesome things that we may do belong ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after this, we are going to send salawat upon the Prophet and you, as that they mention, is that you visualize the noble person of the Prophet ﷺ in your heart and send salutations to him with love and longing to be with him. Allah would have not put the salam to the Prophet ﷺ in the heart unless that's what he wanted you to focus on. And in fact, that we say to him, As-salamu alayka. We're not saying As-salamu alayhi. You're saying, peace be upon you, which is the kaf al-khitab, the second person. Peace be upon you. And that's what Allah wants you to focus on in that moment. And this indicates the importance of the Prophet And everybody else in prayer, while you're praying, if someone sends salams to you, you just wave to them. But were someone to have lived during the time of the Prophet and were he to have said, salamu alaykum to them, it, while they're in prayer, it's an obligation to return his salam. And there's deep, deep spiritual meaning there. Deep spiritual meaning there. And this actually happened where the Prophet sent salams and asked him, why didn't you return the salams to me? Even if you're in prayer before Allah and Rasulullah sent the salams to you, you have to return salams to him. There's deep meanings there. And people that are masakin, that are cut off from these loki meanings, these experiential meanings of love in connection to the Prophet and who don't understand these types of things, are cutting themselves off from one of the most important things of all in this religion. And unfortunately, if we don't have those connections, let alone that if we deny them, is that 
This is preventing us from withstanding the onslaught of the evil in any time, but especially in the end of time. These are meanings that are foundational to help us withstand as believers that the onslaught of the events of the end of time especially. And more specifically, ta'allab, connecting our hearts to the Prophet loving him, having an intimate relationship with him وسلم, and that sending abundant salawat upon him, reading his life story and recognizing that he is alive in his grave. And the only thing between us and meeting with him is death and dying in a good state. This is how the companions were, this is how we want to be. This is the reality of this deen. And so that when we're sending these salawat that we are imagining the Prophet وسلم, that sending these blessings upon him and peace on him with love and longing. And then there's some beautiful supplications that have been narrated about what it is that we say uh, that towards the end of the prayer. And this is a time where du'a is mustajab. It's a time where prayers are answered. It's a time to supplicate to Allah and to turn to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we make taslim, i.e. we say salam alaikum. And there's different ways of doing this in the different schools. But in the Shafi school you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Making the intention to exit the prayer, but to also greet the angels and those present from the believers. And so this is the way that we exit the prayer. And now, once we say in the Shafi school, Assalamu alaikum, like the Maliki school, even though it's recommended to say more in the Shafi school, your prayer is finished. It's recommended to say wa rahmatullah and then another tasneem to the left. But then the important thing here is how we are right after the prayer. We don't want to be from people, those people who just pray super quickly. Once the prayer somebody going to somebody going to, right? And we're off, right? This is a time that mercy descends. This is a time where it's, there's sakina. There is that a lot of that tranquility in these moments. Uh, we don't, we want to remain in our spots for a minute. And that we want to bring to heart that that might have been the last prayer that we ever get to pray. And what is the first thing to do that soon as say after your prayer is to say astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. You've just prayed, but you're saying astaghfirullah. Teaching us to be broken before Allah, even if we've done something that's good. And we combine between the two emotions of fear and hope. We hope that our prayer is accepted, that we fear that it's been rejected. And so immediately after the prayer, as we're doing our invocations, like how we should be after the day of fasting, this is a time to be present with Allah. And on one hand, you're thankful for Allah having enabled you to pray, having to fast that day, but at the same time, you're between fear and hope. You don't know if it's going to be accepted, or you don't know if it's going to be rejected. And then we ask Allah, Rabbana taqabbal minna. We ask Him to accept our prayers. And one of the great signs they mention about that our prayers have been accepted is that we've asked Allah to accept them. And we want to get in the habit of doing this in all of the different things that we do, all the different acts of goodness that we do. And so this is how we are after the prayer. And then all of these meanings, even though this is a lot, this is a lot. And even if you try to implement this right off the bat, you're like, wow, this is overwhelming. I can't remember all this, right? in my prayers. You begin little by little. Start with a few of them. But you have to go back to this material time and time again. It's not enough just to go over it one time. You'll forget it. By Mughal prayer, let alone Isha, let alone tomorrow, let alone after that, you'll forget it. That you want to come back to it time and time again, time and time again, to remind uh, yourselves of this, and this is what we're all in need of, uh, to remind ourselves of these blessed meanings and that with that, inshallah ta'ala, I think that we will wrap it up and leave. We have about a few minutes for questions. We didn't let, not allow any uh, time for Q&A in the previous session. So we'll allow just a few minutes for questions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless these to be realities within us and to pray the way that the elect of his righteous have prayed and to worship in a way that is pleasing to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and give us insight into this religion to come together time and time again. And, helping one another uh, to
to be people of taqwa, helping one another to be people of piety. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam alhamdulillahi wa sallam Do you have any questions? I think if we would ever let, I think if we would ever legislate uh, the permissibility of beating another man in the masjid, it would be for that reason. Like it is a really serious thing. Um, and it is really incredibly unfortunate that it happens so often because of the type of clothing that people wear. Um, you know, and it's something that we have to collectively just solve. And, um, you know, yes, I think at first, if it happens the first time, you know, it's always good to remind our brothers with etiquette and that type of thing, but it happens over and over again, we should get more and more from it because that's just so incredibly foul. And um, anyhow, I think everybody knows what she's referring to, so I'm not going to be any more explicit. But aside from that, I think the answer to your question is, um, I think you have to simplify it, right? So uh, everything that you're learning here, we've gone into a little bit of detail. I would just simplify it for them, right? Some of the, 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 the main meanings, just you know, a few main points of things that you want them to think about throughout their entire prayer. So that, that's what I would do is to simplify this and do kind of a child's version. Now, I know that Fons Vite has a Ghazali for Prayer for Children's series. Um, I'm not that familiar with how they treat the prayer, but you might want to look into that for some ideas. You might get some ideas to help you with that. But in general, that would be the recommendation is to really simplify it and to have them attached to the overarching meanings. Yeah. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the significance of the speed of the Adhan versus the Aqama. Yeah, so the, the, the Tamdi to draw out the Adhan is, is recommended, right? And really that the Adhan, the purpose there is to let people know that prayer is, is it's the prayer time has entered. Right? So what's befitting for that is kind of an extended Adhan in, in each uh, that word that you say, so that those meanings resonate with the hearts of the people. Um, whereas the iqama, when you say something kind of quickly, when you recite something, it has a different effect on you. Right? So the fact that it's kind of like being extended, the adhan, is that gives you ample time to really think about those meanings and to transition into, okay, now it's time for prayer. But the idea there is that you're getting ready for the prayer and that type of thing, and you're preparing yourself and making wudu. And then, once you hit the iqama, right, it's more like now, prayer is imminent, it's about to happen. And prayer is meeting with Allah. This is munaja, the intimate conversation with Allah. And so that the meaning there, as I've understood it, is that it's to, you know, create that sense in you of the imminence of something. This says when something's done kind of quickly, it just, you know, readies you internally to, to that situates you for what it is that you're about to do. Yeah. So, uh, the first question that I have is about having wudu inside the bathroom. I, in Palestine, for example, people used to have um, sinks outside the bathroom itself so they can have, they can say and recite prayers while, or like make dua while they're yeah. Making the wudu, we don't have it here. Yeah. Um, the second, the second thing is that it's something that I, that I see in the mosques where people actually um, don't put their their feet exactly next to each other, so they don't touch. And is that an obligation that the feet touch feet to feet and shoulder yeah. to shoulder, yeah. or is it actually permissible that people? Because I, I see lack like laxity in in, in, in how people do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it right. makes me wonder about the validity of my prayer. Sure. So the first thing is, is that, um, yeah, uh, usually that in the way in many of the restrooms that we freshen up in is that there are stalls very close to the places that we make wudu. And you will find some scholars who say that the stall itself and inside of it is the bathroom area. Um, and then outside of that, um, is it's permissible to remember Allah Ta'ala because you're outside of the place where actually, because there's a wall there, even though it's a stall and it's open on the top and it's open on the bottom. Um, if it's a room that's closed off, as in some bathrooms and some houses have it, 
definitely, if that door is closed, then you're definitely out of the bathroom when you use the sink. Um, so you do have that, um, you will find scholars that permit the mentioning of Allah Ta'ala outside of the actual bathroom itself. Um, I still personally choose to do it in my heart. I don't like to do it, even if there's, st even if there's stalls there. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's, there are opinions there, but uh, uh, you kind of you have a choice there, kind of what you want to do there. Um, as for the prayer, the most important thing is that you line up with people shoulder to shoulder. Okay? And the asal is, is that your feet are only supposed to be a hand span apart. So I know some people feel like they absolutely have to like stretch their feet out like that to touch the other people's feet. That's not an obligation, definitely. So your prayer is valid, 100%. The most important thing that you want to align up is you want to make sure uh, is that your, your heels are lined up with everyone else's heels. So you're not before people or you're not behind people. And you're lined up shoulder to shoulder. Um, and there are indications where sometimes people to make sure would extend their feet. Uh, but in general, the most important thing is to line up shoulder to shoulder and not be too far behind or too far ahead. Because in some schools, they line up with the toes, others by the heels. Whatever message you're praying in, there should be an understanding of how it is that people line up for prayer. So you make sure that you're in line. Uh, but it's not an obligation, definitely, to make your feet touch their feet. Um, and um, uh, usually in most of the places that I've been is that, um, even though with some of those narrations that some of the companions used to do that, is that uh, the sunnah remains of just keeping your feet a hand span apart, whether you touch the people's feet or not. Yeah. No, they should touch. Shoulders should touch. Yeah. yeah. Shoulders should touch. Um, I had a question regarding the inner states of prayer. Um, one of the, yeah, one of the things I've struggled with is like what to think about or like how to feel throughout the stages of the the prayer. And what would you say is like for like newbies that are or people who tend to get distracted easily? Like, I guess we're seeing here that you should be in, have raja and haya, and I think you talked about that. That at the end you should have some hope as well as fear. And then there's the state of ta'zim. What's like for people who are starting and to progress, like what's like one or two states that they could just embody to keep it simple? So to keep it simple, and perhaps Imam Mozadi mentioned those different states ahead of time because they're going to naturally come out throughout your prayer if you're focusing on what it is that you're reciting. Right? So let's say you're, you're reciting the Fatiha, right? And that you're saying... There's definitely going to be ta'adim and exaltation there, right? And then if you say ar-Rahman and rahim that might be a time as well from among the meanings as you're hoping for His mercy. Maliki yomidin, that's fear. wa a feeling of absolute helplessness. Akala, and then ihdina surat al amta alayhim. Again, there's fear and there's hope and that you might even have shame come there about, my goodness, what have I done? And then when you recite a chapter of the Quran, depending upon the chapter, again, different emotions might come out based on what it is that you're reciting. But then in the bowing position, again, that's ta'udin and combined with awe and fear. And likewise in sujood. But then also too, which I'm actually surprised he didn't mention it among those states of the prayer, is also love. Love is also that one of the very important inner states of heart. I'm actually surprised they didn't mention it in the prayer uh, because that's definitely a part of this, loving Allah. And as you worship Him, that you have love in your heart for Him and so forth. So if you, the way I would recommend doing it is, now that you know those six things, go back from the beginning, according to the outline here, and see which ones fit in where. And that will kind of help you, very practically speaking, uh, make that your state as you do those things. Okay. You, have you have to slow down. Well, it's like anything else, right? It's like, again, I always go back to the analogy of sports, right? Um, in order, my game was basketball. If you're going to be a good basketball player, you can't think about what you're doing when you're playing. But you work on your footwork separately. The laborsome part, you just sit there and work on your footwork, work on your footwork, work on your footwork, right? You work on your defense separately and different things in defense. 
whether you're closing someone out or whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, you're shot, you're working, your free throws are different than when uh, you're shooting off the dribble or when you're shooting off of a screen or catch and shoot, like all of those are individual skills. And you might be good at one and not the other. So you have to work on all of those things separately. And then in game time, you have to just hope you have muscle memory and just, you can't think about those things. So the same thing is in prayer is that you have to work on it piece by piece. And then the more energy coming will come together. Kind of as you, you know, we'll just take let's uh, just do, let's one just do, or two other. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple online as well. Good. Mm -hmm. Let's do the sister. Yeah, and, okay. then, and then we'll take the one right. online. And we'll talk about the show. I really uh, liked your suggestion that we pray as a congregation at home. Um, but for those of us with young children, it gets quite distracting. And so if we want to, you know, as mothers, cultivate everything that we learned today, would you recommend we, like, pray in congregation that pray on our own or, like, focus on this and pray on the land? <laughs> Yeah, my kids are all older now, so it's less of an issue. But I did also have kids that were young. And um, one thing is you have to do your best. So we're living in societies where we all we oftentimes can't practice the ideal. And part of learning this is, is at least you make the intention. Ya Rab, I have the intention in my heart to pray every prayer in congregation. Um, and keep in mind, this is also part of the modern world, is that people don't tend to live with extended families. So in traditional settings, there were so many people around, it was very easy to pray jama'ah, okay? So the, the rule of like only one congregational prayer in your home uh, is the general rule, but if because of children um, that someone um, prays separate congregations, then that's perfectly fine, and it's actually probably advisable. If you think that having chil the children are, in, in, there's not something that you can have them do to keep them quiet during the time of prayer, that it requires that you be with them, then it might be better to have someone watch the children and then that pray a separate congregation after and have other people watch the children after. And if you can, in the midst of that, have uh, that a second congregation where there's still at least two of you praying, then that's great. And so you try to do, you try to do your best and then try to be creative in terms of how you set up the prayer time, right? Where uh, that there's some type of activity or something like that. Um, and that might be one of the times where you give them minimal use of something of a device, right? And something tasteful, like we shouldn't always use the devices for that, but if you're going to use a device with something tasteful, that might be a time in a limited fashion to do that in. Yeah. Okay, Sheikh, we have a question uh, from some online viewers about praying while flying. Uh, can you give some tips to pray outside at airports or inside airplanes? Also. What if one has to make wudu on an airplane during a long flight other than wearing wudu socks? Is there any other dispensation? Yeah, so um, I've never ever felt comfortable giving, telling people that it's okay to pray standing, uh, to pray, excuse me, sitting on planes. I know you'll find those photos out there. Uh, what I would say is, is that do your best to pray standing. If for some reason, like, yeah, I need the seatbelt sign is on and you're about to land and the prayer time just came in, then I would say, okay, pray in your seat and then make it up after. Uh, but alhamdulillah, that my wife and kids, we always pray standing on planes, um, unless that for some reason that we're unable to do so, or at least we try to. Um, so I think prayer has to come first. And alhamdulillah, the only planes that I've ever not been able to stand up on was always a Muslim plane, which is really strange. I've never had a problem ever praying standing on a non-Muslim plane. Um, and I, it's, you know, I think, you know, it is what it is, but I would recommend that, uh, you know, and obviously if you're flying on a smaller plane from like a smaller city to another small city, it might not be possible to stand up. If that's the case, you pray sitting and then you make up your prayer after. Uh, so I would say that try first and foremost to, even if you have to pay a little bit more, to select your flights according to prayer. Okay, so last time I was here, that we ended up flying back, and we did a red-eye flight, but we realized that we would have to pray Fajr on the plane. So we went through Chicago intentionally, so Fajr came in, we prayed Fajr, and then caught the connecting flight after that, uh, and there, it worked out that way. And so try to arrange your flight schedule so that 
you can pray. We give prayer, you know, preference. And oftentimes we can do that. Uh, so then, uh, let's just say you're traveling to like Australia. It's like the classic one for me. It's because you end up going to have to pray like four or sometimes five prayers on the plane. Um, you still have to pray. And it's fairly easy to determine the Qibla based upon the flight maps. Uh, and you determine the Qibla. And if there's a place for you to pray, just ask them kindly. Say, I need to pray. And usually that it's facilitated. And that, yes, it's very good for both men and women to invest in a pair of wudu socks. There's many kinds now. They used to only be available in like uh, some Islamic bookstores and stuff. But now they're even on uh, Amazon. Like Randy Sun is a good brand. Uh, and they all seem to probably have the same... Uh, they just probably relabel them, seem to be the same manufacturer. Anyhow, uh, I would invest in a pair of those, make sure you have wudu when you put them on, and then it's so much easier. Uh, but even then, like, if you have to make wudu and put water on your feet, I, I would just recommend just getting the floor wet. So just make wudu, right? Uh, getting the floor a little bit wet, and then just drying it at the end. Definitely dry it. And so what I, I, the times that I've had to wash my feet in the plane, you just put water in your hand, Put your foot over the toilet, wash your foot again, use water again, and then it's totally doable. And then at the end, make sure you clean it up so you don't leave it dirty. You just wipe it all up. Uh, and it's possible to do, although it's a little bit difficult. Uh, the only plane I've seen that has a drain is Saudi Arabian Airlines, which is really nice. Because then they actually have a drain in the ground because they know people are making wudu on it, which is really helpful. Um, but that's what I would recommend. Uh, is to plan your prayers, uh, plan your flights accordingly, and then to try to remain in a state of wudu if possible, wear socks, uh, find a nice place, and that pray your prayers standing, definitely, if you're able to do so. One more, two, one more? Uh, maybe one last one. One last one, okay. This brother was asking. Uh, question towards uh, dua. Once we finish the prayer, uh, back if we are in Jama, like uh, what, what we have seen is a couple of times back home, like people make a long dua and a short dua. Sometimes they skip it. So what's the rule and what's the recommendation? After prayer? After prayer. Yeah, it's a great time to make dua. That's a, a, a very blessed time. And th these are the same times where you have different schools of thought that permit different things. And then that there's beautiful culture that comes into play here as well, uh, which is not in conflict with the religion. So these things are in general very good. And I would recommend kind of going with the flow in terms of whatever is the way of doing things in the particular locale uh, that you are. And um, you know, hopefully that will uh, start to develop more and more here. And that we have to recognize is not not every cultural manifestation is wrong. Some of them are valid, that legally valid, um, that uh, in acceptable manifestations of, of uh, good innovations. So there's a lot of room there. But in general, this is a very good time, you know, to to make dua. And um, it's you know, throughout the Muslim world, this is a time that you see people in prayers right after they. Yeah, so that could be something uh, that, uh, you know, I don't know the specific reason for that particular manifestation, uh, but um, that it's dua, you know, so dua is a good thing, right? And what is the specific reason for after Fajr and after Asr? I'm not sure. But again, our tradition is vast, and we, we want to be very careful not to deny certain things. So I don't know the exact answer to your question, but I've seen enough diversity of ways of doing things to not jump to any conclusions and you know, if you would ask them you know especially the scholars among where is this coming from uh, that they're likely to have you know a basis for it yeah.